Okay, so today we're going to do some radioactivity review. We're going to cover all the concepts we've talked about in about the last week. Uh, it's going to be one of those you try, I go over kind of quest or kind of lessons today. Here we go. Uh, so the concepts we're going to review today are radioactivity, half-life, nuclear fission and fusion, as well as mass equivalence. Uh, so again, it's going to be a you try, I go over lesson, and you're definitely going to need your formula booklet today. Anyway, here we go. Question one, americium-241 is used in smoke detectors. The americium undergoes alpha decay, producing a small current. When smoke enters the chamber, this obstructs the current, uh, triggering the alarm. Write out the active, sorry, write out the alpha decay equation for americium-241. Uh, pause the video here, give this one a try. All right, I'm gonna go over this one now. Uh, alpha decay are actually quite nice to work with once you start getting the hang of them. First things first is write out the uh, atomic symbol for americium-241. So that's AM-241 is your number up here. Uh, and then americium, if you look at your periodic table, always is gonna have an atomic number. So in other words, a number of protons of 95. Now, how alpha decay works uh, is basically an alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons. So two protons and four nucleons in total uh, gets released. So what that means is this number down here is gonna have to drop by two, and this number up here is gonna have to drop by four. So no matter what, we're gonna have a product that has 93 and 237. But what on earth kind of uh, element is gonna appear right here? Well, that's where you have to use your, your periodic table. Uh, remember, the atomic number down here is what dictates what type of element you're actually looking at. So now that you know this number had to drop down by two to 93, you look at your, uh, your periodic table and you're gonna see what one has uh, an atomic number of 93, and that's gonna be Neptunium, which is NP. So Neptunium-237, that's gonna be your product of your alpha decay. Uh, and then don't forget your alpha particle, which is the little alpha symbol with a two down here and a four uh, up here. That's all you gotta do for this one. That's literally what the whole formula would be. Uh, we're gonna do a few more that are like this as well. So the next one, write out the beta positive decay equation for nitrogen 12. You might wanna look back through your notes on this one for beta positive decay. This was one that always uh, slips me up, but anyway, give this one a try. All right, I'm gonna go over this one now. Just like before, start by writing what your, your parent nucleus is here. So it's nitrogen 12, so nitrogen 12 is N12. Take a look at your periodic table to see what the atomic number is for nitrogen, it happens to be seven. Uh, and then with beta positive decay, what gets released is a beta positive particle. Now a beta positive particle is the antimatter equivalent of an electron, so we call it a positron uh, because it has all the properties of an electron, it's just antimatter though, so it has a positive charge to it. What that means is basically this number down here uh, is gonna have to go down by one because we're gonna be releasing a beta positive particle that's gonna account for it. So we're gonna have our daughter uh, nucleus here have six as our uh, atomic number, and six is an atomic number, of course, means it's gonna be carbon. You have to look at your periodic table to determine that. Um, but your nucleon number, however, is not going to change because really what's happening here is that proton is turning uh, into a neutron, right? So in other words, that's staying up here as 12. So even though you had your proton number go down by one, your nucleons in total still stays at 12 because that proton just became a neutron. What gets released though, like I mentioned before, is a beta positive particle. So it's that beta symbol, it's kind of like a weird stretch B, uh, with a one down here and a zero up here. This one doesn't mean that this beta positive particle is a proton, it just means it has a positive one charge, right? So that's really all we're meaning by this, and that's what keeps this positive charge piece down here all balanced out. Now the other thing that gets released from here is something called a neutrino, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later as to, to what they are. Uh, we're actually really, to be honest, we're just going to scrape the surface of it. So if you want to Google what a neutrino is, you're, you're welcome to do so. But the neutrino symbol is basically just a V. Now, for, for beta decay, I don't think I mentioned it in the first lesson we had on this one. Uh, this is the one that always slips me up because I always get beta positive and beta negative decay mixed up. But you have to keep in mind that no matter what kind of beta decay happens, there's always going to be some form of antimatter as well as some form of neutrino that get produced. With beta positive decay, it's your beta particle that is gonna be positive, and our beta po particle shouldn't be positive unless it's antimatter. So this, in this case, is our antimatter piece. Uh, and because only one piece of antimatter gets produced by a beta decay, the other one, in this case, our neutrino, must be just a regular neutrino. If this was beta negative decay, then our beta particle would have been negative, and we would have had an anti-neutrino, so a V with a little bar on the top of it, and an anti-neutrino would have been formed from that. 
Okay, so I put this in on purpose because beta decay always slips me up and I would imagine uh, many of you guys are the same. Next one, gamma decay. Write out the gamma decay equation for barium-137. Give this one a try. So this one, kind of a silly question. Honestly, this is actually the easiest one of the bunch. Gamma decay is probably the, the most silly one to even write out. Start by writing out barium-137. Barium has a symbol of Ba. Uh, 137 is, of course, your isotope number. If you look on your periodic table for what your atomic number is, you're going to find that it's 56. Gamma decay has the most boring equation of all. It's literally what you started with, your arrow, and then what you started with again. No change in numbers whatsoever. However, you also have to include that you're releasing a gamma particle. So gamma particle is going to look like a really weird Y. I always struggle with these. How I usually draw them is like, oops, uh-oh, going back, going back. Here we go. Uh, I usually draw them by like doing like a backwards Y. So I go like this and then like this, right? It doesn't have to be perfect as long as it's some symbol that looks like that. I'll know what you mean. So that's gamma decay. It doesn't change what your uh, particle really is. It's just releasing energy in the form of a gamma ray. So really this is happening because it is basically taking its atoms and moving them to a lower orbital. Or sorry, it's electrons moving into a lower orbital is what I mean. All right, half-life. Archaeologists and paleontologists use something called carbon dating to determine how old ancient specimens are. Carbon-14 exists and is replenished in living things. So in all living things, carbon-14 is something that's being replenished within them. After death, carbon-14 undergoes constant beta-negative decay and becomes nitrogen-14. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. What percentage to the nearest tenth of carbon-14 would be expected in a bone sample from the Haddison mummy, this guy right here, who is 3,200 years old. Anyway, pause the video here. Again, we're looking for the percentage of carbon-14 that would be left uh, after uh, 3,200 years. All right, I'm gonna go over this one. First things first, the half-life formula is N equals N zero times one half to the power of little n. That's how it looks on your formula sheet. I don't like this for the fact that this little n is very obscure. Little n just stands for the number of times your half-life is passing. I prefer to write that as n equals your elapsed time, so how much time has passed, divided by the time that defines your half-life, okay? Throwing these numbers in means n, capital N, equals your original amount, which I'll say is 100%, because we're asked for a percentage here, 100% times 1 half to the power of time elapsed divided by your half-life. Well, your elapsed time in this case is 3,200, and your half-life is 5,730 years. Throw this in your calculator, round to the nearest tenth, and you're gonna find that your amount remaining afterwards is 67.9%. Which makes sense, that's not even 50%, because again, we didn't even cross that half-life amount of years, right? So if it had been 5,730 years, they would have seen half as much carbon-14 uh, in this mummy afterwards. Uh, so again, carbon dating is a really useful way of figuring out how old something is, uh, just by checking the isotopes that exist within a certain sample uh, and finding the proportion that is there compared to the proportion that should be. Um, and again, if you want more details on this, I'm sure you can look it up by looking at carbon dating. Uh, but my understanding is in all living things, uh, carbon-14 exists in an equal amount to another isotope of carbon called carbon-12, which is ultimately what, you know, is the, is the baseline amount of carbon, right? So uh, carbon-14 is supposed to be the same as carbon-12, but if uh, that ratio is off, then you know that that thing you know, has undergone some, some decay over time. Anyway, moving on. Nuclear fission. Most modern nuclear weapons use plutonium-239 in their fission reaction. Calculate the energy released in the fission reaction of a single plutonium-239 atom, given the reaction. So there's the reaction right there, showing all the reactants and, of course, the products in a nuclear fission reaction of uh, plutonium-239. I want to see how much energy is released in this. So I'll give you a hint. You'll need to use your mass defect to find the answer to this one. Give it a try. All right, I'm going to go over this one now. This is the hardest one I think that we've covered so far, unless, unless you're really comfortable with this. And honestly, once you start doing it, it's not too bad. Uh, the formula we're going to need to use here is going to be energy is equal to mc squared. Uh, however, the m in this case needs to be your mass defect. And your mass defect is your initial mass minus your final mass. So that's going to be what's times in uh, our c squared here. Uh, now, before we actually go about doing this, we need to recognize that our initial mass refers to the initial mass of all of our reactants, and our final mass refers to the mass of all of our products. Uh, so I'll calculate this. I won't show all the work on this one just because I think it is a little bit redundant. Uh, but your initial mass would be the mass of your plutonium, which is this right here, 
plus the mass of a single neutron. Because remember, a neutron is striking your plutonium, triggering the fission reaction. Uh, if you add those two numbers together, what you get as, a, as an initial mass is 3.986349 times 10 to the negative 25 kilograms. Uh, and as for a final mass, you would have to add the mass of your xenon, your zirconium, and then three neutrons together. Uh, and if you do that, you should find that it's 3.982947 times 10 to the negative 25. So notice a very subtle difference. Your final mass is a little bit lower than your initial mass, as it should be, because that is how fission reactions occur. Uh, so what we're going to get on this one is, if we throw this into our formula, E is equal to uh, mi, you know, I'm just going to write it as mi to save time. You can see the number. It's right there, minus uh, mf, which is also right there, times by c squared. That one I will write in. It's 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Don't forget to square it after, outside the brackets there. Uh, if you throw this in your calculator and then round to, I guess, five sig digs in this one, you're going to find that the answer is 3.0618 times 10 to the negative 11 joules. See, once you see the work done, it's actually not too bad. Yeah, I cut corners, but you get the idea. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not too bad. Uh, yeah, now anyway, the last thing that's in this, I guess I, I just threw it in just so it'd be something else to discuss. Here's like a social studies plug right here. Uh, I'm sure you've already checked out the graph by now. That's, that graph is showing the estimated global nuclear warhead inventories from 1945 till the year 2020. Uh, what's amazing by it uh, is just how many nuclear weapons the world had. Uh, especially in the uh, late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, what's remarkable is during this time, of course, the Soviet Union, or now known, of course, as Russia, uh, had so much more nuclear weapons than uh, the United States does. And even still to this day, the, the Russians do have more nukes uh, than the United States, uh, but it isn't nearly as significant as the lead as before. And the good news is the global nuclear stockpile has gone down significantly. I do know in the early 1990s, there were a bunch of treaties. There was the SALT Treaty and the START Treaty, and there was a few others in there. Uh, they were all signed that basically said, we're gonna start cutting down our nuclear stockpiles. And you can clearly see the effect, uh, especially uh, with those two nations right there, uh, that there was a period of disarmament, uh, and then the amount of nuclear weapons has decreased significantly. But we're still at a point where we have a lot of nuclear weapons. Yeah, that looks like not very much, but if you look at the total amount of nuclear weapons that exist in the world to this day, uh, it's looking like it's at about 15,000. 15,000 nuclear weapons. That's enough to give a nuclear weapon to every single person in Brooks, Alberta. Like, that's insane, right? Yeah, it's not the 70,000 that it peaked at in the mid-1980s, uh, but it's still pretty darn bad. Like, that is a lot of nuclear weapons that exist in the world. Uh, and the other thing to note from this, notice all of the other nuclear nations, China, France, India, Israel, North Korea, Pakistan, United Kingdom, they hardly even register on this one. Like, I think the United Kingdom... I could be mistaken, like don't quote me on this, but I think the United Kingdom actually leads the pack of those countries on the number of nuclear weapons. And I think they only have like 300, which again is nothing compared to uh, what uh, the United States or Russia have, right? Like thousands, thousands is what they got. Anyway, moving on, that's enough of a soapbox. Last question here today, it's a mass equivalence question. Determine the mass equivalence of a single green photon with a wavelength of 550 nanometers. So in other words, if you were to turn that photon into a mass, what would that mass be? Give this one a shot. All right, so I'm gonna go over this one now. This one is a, it's a little bit more work, but it's not too bad. Uh, first things first, when we talk about mass equivalence, we're really just saying that we wanna connect energy to mass, right? Photons carry a lot of energy with them. That should not be a surprise to us. Uh, higher energy photons are things like X-rays or gamma rays, uh, or even within the visible light spectrum, things like blue or violet, those are higher energy. Uh, and lower energy would be things like the color red, uh, or certainly more like radio waves or microwaves. Those are very low energy waves. Um, but basically, we want to find the amount of energy that this photon has and then connect it to mass. And the thing that connects energy to mass is, of course, E equals mc squared. But how do we find the energy of a photon? This is a bit of a throwback to the last unit we had. Well, the energy of the photon, when you're given the wavelength, uh, is equal to hc over lambda. Lambda, of course, being your wavelength. Now, h should be the h value that is measured in joules because energy in joules will be compatible to mass in kilograms. Uh, so let's get started on that one. E is going to equal h in joules, which is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34, times by c, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8, uh, divided by your wavelength, which you need to put into meters. So I'll make that 550 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. Uh, that's going to give me my energy 
is equal to about 3.616364 times 10 to the negative 19, oops, not 12, 19 joules. There we go. Now we want to set this energy to be a mass equivalence. So we'll set this equal now to mc squared. So m, of course, is what we're looking for. We want to find what the mass would be if this energy was converted into mass. Uh, and c, of course, is 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Uh, and then we have to square that. So just divide away by 3.0 times 10 to the 8 squared. And you're going to find that the mass is a ridiculously low number. It's uh, 4.02 times 10 to the negative 36 kilograms. Uh, now, just because uh, the exponents can sometimes not really paint a very clear picture of exactly how small this is, uh, do understand that that is about one billionth, one billionth the mass of a proton. So if you took a proton and cut it into a billion pieces, that's what would be the equivalent of a mass of a photon. That's why we usually say photons really don't have mass. And again, this is a mass equivalence. It's not a true mass. Um, but still, it is a good indication of what it would be what it would, would be worth, right, in terms of a mass. Uh, and the lesson learned is there, not very much. All right, so for practice, your atomic physics assignment. This is where it's starting to get a lot more serious here. Uh, the assignment's been available for like two weeks now. Uh, it is due on Friday. So you need to make sure that that is done by the end of the week. You can complete up to question 26 right now. Please make sure you do that, especially before Thursday, uh, because those last few questions, there's about four of them, uh, those are only possible after Thursday's lesson. So unless you want to jump forward and watch Thursday's lesson now, get them done, whatever. I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, recommend it, but uh, up to you. Uh, again, make sure you have that stuff done, handed in by Friday. Anyway, as always, though, if you need any help, if there's anything on that that's uh, stumping you, please let me know. Uh, and best of luck on that, uh, that quiz tomorrow. I believe it's a formative one. Again, I'm recording this like a week in advance. Yeah, it's a formative one. You're good. It's a formative quiz tomorrow, but best of luck on it anyway. Uh, I want to see what you guys are capable of on this one. Uh, talk to you soon.